Welcome to Media Path. I'm Louise Palenker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Yeah, he forgot his line. We ran into a detour on our media path today, Fritz. Uh, Burt Ward was scheduled. He may have seen a bat signal. I'm not sure what happened. But for us, it was pow, oof, clang. We were dinged. But the universe is quite a place. So today it's directing us towards my friend Paul Rock, whose son Jacob is a nonverbal autistic young man. And along with his friend Rob Laufer, he has composed a symphony which reveals the music that is playing in his head. Paul will join us very soon. But first, Fritz, we have some things to report. We've got some business to do. We've got some reviews, and we want to share them with you. Let's do it. I want to hear all about your gathering at your home. Oh, yeah. It was just one of those days where Adam Schiff comes over, you know, how I do. Yeah, he came over during a hurricane. Yeah, it was a hurricane. And we'll talk, talk about how that was. Yeah. Oh, do you want to hear that now? Okay. Yeah. So we had a fundraiser for Adam Schiff, and it was and Hurricane Hillary was on her way. She got there just a little prior to Adam Schiff. So we had to quickly move everything inside. And uh, a fine time was had. Congressman Schiff was wonderful. He talked with everybody. I arranged for him to meet two of our area Holocaust survivors. And it was just the most beautiful, heartbreaking conversation I've ever been witness to. I was just so uh, honored to be there. And uh, so thank you, Congressman Schiff, for gracing our uh, our homestead. And we uh, immediately afterwards, the I mean, even while he was speaking, the heavens cleared, the clouds parted. And after he pulled out the driveway, our, my brother-in-law, Ian, called and he said, did you guys see the rainbow? So me, I like, I will chase a rainbow. I will chase fireworks. I am that person. So I go running upstairs. And this was what was greeting us. It's a full rainbow. And I know, Fritz, that that was my mm. mom smiling. Oh, that's a beautiful picture. Yeah. It really is. Did he allow questions and answers at the end of his yeah, stump he, speech? Yeah, he, he had a really uh, impressive stump what, speech. What, what were then, some of the questions that people asked him? People, oh my gosh, I, 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 should, have a, I should have prepared an answer for you, Fritz. How do we get the message across? that the Republicans are not their, their father's Republican Party anymore, yeah. mm -hmm. that they are evil, <laughs> that they are moronic, yeah. that they have a bunch of whack jobs in office right now mm -hmm. who are keeping us from progressing in a proper fashion in this country. How do we, how do we raise the level of that conversation? Um, well, you remind me of a conversation I have with my father. My father is 95 <laughs> uh, and lives in Boca Raton where every day is like a Seinfeld episode. <laughs> and uh, he asked me what I thought of Kevin McCarthy. And I try to clean, keep it clean with my dad. Uh, and I said, well, dad, I don't think too highly of the guy. Uh, I think he's a bad egg. I tried to use a little of the vernacular of his time, uh, to which he responded, well, then, as my bubby used to say, fuck him. <laughs> I hear this criticism of Democrats quite often, uh, that the Republicans are much simpler and tougher on message. Um, and, and I think there's truth to that. I also think they have the advantage of having Fox, which is a, a uniquely powerful amplifier. Um, but our offsetting advantage has to be uh, the presidency, uh, which is also a powerful bully pulpit. Uh, and uh, I remember in the first year of the Biden presidency having a meeting with one of the president's top policy advisors. It was about a policy matter, but I used the opportunity to ask, do you mind if I give the administration some unsolicited political advice? Because I'm sure you're not getting enough of that. <laughs> uh, and I said, I would have the president take one page out of Donald Trump and one page only, and it is the endlessly self-promotional page. Yes. Yes. He needs yes. to be out there five times a day yes. telling the country the three or four things he is yes. most proud of having done yes. uh, until they can recite it in their sleep. Every question was really, really good and powerful, and he wrapped it all up brilliantly. It was just a wonderful day. One of the smartest guys in Congress, and all politics is local, I, I, I knew it would be stuff. What affects them up there? So good for him. 
He's a, he's a good human being. Yeah, and I have my um, Adam Schiff bumper stickers now that grace our desk. So. Fantastic. Well, you know, we never uh, let a, per- a possibility of uh, doing some shameless self-promotion pass. And we have some nice reviews. People are responding well to this little production. First is from a lady or a man named Makeover Game. She just says, entertaining and interesting. And maybe we can get a free makeover out of it. I don't know what I'm this down. person does. Mm-hmm. Here's another one. Love listening to Fritz and Wheezy chat with each other and their guests. Always really interesting. And here's one from Hamburger Helper One. Eclectic deep dives. This podcast is such a wide and deep net in the history of pop culture and entertainment. I'm blown away by the topics they cover. And the hosts are great speakers with good chemistry and rapport. God bless you and everything you stand for. It's really listenable, and at the same time, the hosts give you a very cozy and comfortable feeling, despite what could be, in other hands, very dry and dense topics. We don't have any dry or dense topics. (laughs) Of course, she would look for the most negative aspect of the entire review. This is a fantastic, this is like we paid a publicist to write this review. No more dry or dense topics. And, uh, so what have you been watching this All week? right, this is a good movie, if you're a history person. I want to introduce you to a film that's playing only in theaters right now. It's Golda. It's the uh, story of Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel. And this particular episode is her leadership during the 19-day Yom Kippur War in 1973. It's an interesting look at history, but it is heavy. I don't know what's more distressing about this movie, the near collapse of the state of Israel or gold is chain smoking. This woman seriously smoked about four packs of cigarettes during this movie. She lights a cigarette with another cigarette. She smokes in bed. The smoke itself is a metaphor. If you're triggered by smoking, there's a lot of smoking. Yeah. And ultimately, it it, uh, kills her, draws it to its natural conclusion, which is a horrible lung disease. The state of Israel had only been in existence for 40 years at the point of this film. During the Six-Day War in 1967, Israel had captured the Sinai Peninsula, and the Yom Kippur War was the Egyptians and Syrians exacting revenge. There was about a 48-hour period when it looked like Israel would be lost. Prime Minister Meir did some shotgun diplomacy with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to get some planes and other armaments. Kissinger is played by Lieb Shriver, who has that baritone Kissinger voice down to a T. Kissinger said the U.S. couldn't help Israel much at that time because of the 1973 oil crisis. Finally, the U.S. came through. Kissinger demanded that Israel make a settlement and give back the Sinai, and that famous peace accord was born between Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin that the plenty of footage of. They intercut the film with old newsreel footage, which bumps up the realism, but it is heavy. It, it, and it seems kind of sad, too, because Golda Meir apparently had a great sense of humor, but you don't see that until the last five minutes of the film in some newsreel footage. But if you're interested in 20th century history, post-World War II history, you will forgive the heaviness. It's beautiful. And and uh, Helen Mirren plays a phenomenal uh, Golda Meir. And the way the film is just weighed down with the enormity of what was on her shoulders. She's responsible for so many lives. She's responsible for this nation that they are they are building. So you you feel just the 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 strain of it on her. My brother tells me it's probably based on a play that he saw because it does read like a play, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, she's it's, on camera all the time and it's just three or four peripheral figures. Exactly. So it was it was called, I think, Golda's Rooftop. He said uh, Tova Felchu played, played Golda uh, on Broadway. And yes, she's up on that roof a lot. There's metaphors with birds. It's very dark. It's oppressive. There's a lot of close-ups of liquid and it's all metaphoric but you just feel the oppression of what if this were your responsibility so mm-hmm. and uh, you will go out of there and if you ever see a person smoking a cigarette again you will slap them in their face oh i i, I did earlier today i crazy I no, no i no yeah it's just golda it, you're right she was she was I think she was a delightfully brilliant person, and not all of her personality comes across in in this film. No, and she went to the University of Wisconsin or something. She's I mean, she has almost no accent, and and she was the first powerful head of a nation, and not only a head of a nation, a nation a that was just starting. Yeah, as a, I, I'm as a female yeah. head of a nation. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, just amazing. Uh, 
so we recommend it, but don't, you know, you may not finish your popcorn. You know, I'm just going to. Okay. So my recommendation is Silo on Apple TV. Silo is a dystopian sci-fi drama based on the books by Hugh Howey. It's set in a desolate and toxic future where a dusty community shares an enormous underground silo, hundreds of stories deep within the Earth's surface. Are the laws and dictates of this suppressed society designed to protect them or contain them, or both? How does leadership maintain order? By controlling the narrative, infuse healthy doses of obfuscation and fear, and you've got a tightly managed population. Until, of course, our hero questions the messaging. The series opens with Rashida Jones as that one voice. But in the teachings of Barry Manilow, we learn that just one voice singing in the darkness will inspire others to look around and find there's more. Rashida stirs the questioning of David Oyelowo and then Rebecca Ferguson, who plays Juliet, a scrappy individualist whose mind wasn't meant for dogma and secrecy. Our story begins 150 years after the silo's creation. All pre-silo history has been removed from the curriculum. Any device from the before times is called a relic and is strictly forbidden. Whether it's a camcorder, a hard drive, or a Pez dispenser, it's contraband. And amusingly, our heroes struggle to determine any use for a Pez dispenser in a world without Pez. The camcorder and the hard drive? No spoilers. In silo leadership roles are Tim Robbins and Common. They know something about something, but are keeping it and the population on lock. When someone decides to leave the silo, they walk out in a spacesuit. They clean the camera lens, giving residents a clearer view of the desolation. They walk away, collapse, and die. Before they leave, the mayor offers this speech. We do not know why we are here. We do not know who built the silo. We do not know why everything outside the silo is as it is. We do not know when it will be safe to go outside. We only know that day is not this day. But is that season this season? Watch and see. All right. All right. So I think we're ready for our guest who stepped in last minute because I was just scrolling Facebook to see who's promoting something because we were supposed to have Burt Ward Robin from Batman, and he, um, he just headed down some sort of fire pole and off in that Batmobile in another direction, and we're thrilled to welcome you. Thanks for joining us. So a little bit about Paul Rock. Paul Rock is a founder and director of the Wild Honey Foundation. He is an event producer and an autism activist. So tell us, we'll start with you, Paul, and then we'll get to you, Rob. Or maybe I'll have Paul introduce more about Rob. Tell us where this road began for you You're in, in activism for autism. Um, my son Jacob was, who's 19 now, was born uh, with severe autism. Um, he was diagnosed at two and a half. And uh, currently he is able to speak two words, yes and eat. Um, that's, his, that's his verbal nature. Um, but he, and during COVID, he learned to type on an iPad um, to express his thoughts. And which he surprised everybody, including everybody at school, had pegged him at some sort of a third grade level uh, where he immediately showed them he had a college level vocabulary, um, could spell words that they didn't even know he knew and uh, knew grammar and could make sentences and proceeded to show everybody he was a, a smart person he'd been telling everybody um, about over when he started typing his first one of his first typed words sentences was i'm smart so oh my goodness oh yeah. bless his heart so a little bit more about that because i've been following you on facebook for a while so i've been following sure. jacob's journey as well as yours sure. and then the poetry started coming and i i yes. didn't get the beginning of how you unlocked his mind with the iPad. Could you tell us how that works and if that's if that's working across autism uh, in nonverbal yeah, kids? Okay. Sure. Explain. There are many. Bit. There are many kids who are are, are currently typing. Um, it takes a long time because his motor planning is really terrible. He can't. You know, the main reason he can't talk is because he has no motor planning, hmm. and so um, it took seven years of kind of hand over hand to get him to the point where he could start typing letters. I mean, he knew all the letters, he knew the alphabet, um, but getting him to, you know, just physically do the work, it took like seven years of, of kind of repetitive over hand over hand work. And then it kind of paid off. It really paid off once he was uh, home for Zoom school. 
Um, and then I was with him 24 seven doing, you know, school with him. And so that's when he really blossomed and he really started showing how much he knew and how well he could type. And he kind of just went to town during that time. So that was three years ago. All right. Give us a little insight at, with one of Jacob's poems, because you post his poems often on Facebook and I'm just I'm, sure. I'm overwhelmed. I have one here. This is this is kind of sums up his attitude towards uh, the world. Um, Your assumptions are wrong is, is the title. Everything I read is digested in my brain and locked away. I'm a prisoner in my body, but breaking out in style. I love my dad for rescuing me for from the sadness. Um, I make great noise every time I lay my mouth on my iPad. Mind over matter will save my life. No matter what you think of me and my noises, he makes a lot of noises when he just is about. Um, I am listening and learning. My sadness is gone, and I am tremendously ready to take on the world. I, I got to tell you, this whole story from start to finish is breathtaking. And it reminds me of the movie called The Butterfly and the Diving Bell. Did you see that movie by any chance? No, I didn't. This is a I story. It. It, it's a it's a foreign film. I can't remember which uh, country. Uh, but this very famous and uh, uh, and prolific writer has a stroke. And okay. he continues to yes, be... Yes, I did see that. Yeah. Yes. He continues yeah. to have all of this creativity and right. all of, he has these ideas which have not suffered in his stroke at all, just his right. ability to communicate them has suffered. Exactly. And it, and I, it just... You, you, Jacob's story resonated with me in the same way. He He's found this portal where he can express himself and uh, it, it's very uplifting. I'm interested in... How you got to the music aspect of it? How did you realize that he wanted to express himself musically? Well, music is 24-7 in this house, and that's pretty much what, what I do. And so we always have a, a playlist going on. We always have music since he was born, since the minute he was born. He's been listening to music. And uh, so, so cut to after he starts typing, like maybe uh, six months after he really gets it down, he just he just typed to me. He said, "I've been writing a symphony." Oh my oh goodness! Oh my gosh! And, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then so he started typing out the description, um, in you know, in words, you know, where it's he vividly sort of describes like violins are angry and they play for thirty seconds or a minute or two minutes, and then they're joined by this instrument. And he basically gives the overview of the seventy one minutes of music that we have now. Um, and and then um, then I gave the um, since I was so amazed by what he was doing, even early on, the first couple of movements, I gave it to I enlisted Rob to uh, become uh, Jacob, Jacob's uh, musical conduit. And uh, he he took up the took up the challenge and uh, started uh, making actual notes out of the descriptions. And and, then, and, and and Jacob kept ownership of this piece of material because if he didn't like something, like a, an individual note or a phrase or even a whole movement, he'd say, nope, get that thing out of here. And well, Rob would he, have, to, he, have to go back to work. He, he did. He, he Well, he, you know, Rob would send over a couple minutes of music and then Jake would give his input. And, and that's how we did it all the way up. But once it was about the 50 percent mark, Rob was so spot on and they were so in the same place that um, it was very few changes after the first the first uh, mi minute uh, first say two or three movements there's six all together well let's and introduce so. rob and, and and get the sure. story from from your perspective this is sure. rob laffer hi rob but maybe rob talk about your uh, history in music and and why you were the skilled person necessary to make this project happen give us your history in music and uh, if you don't mind i'd rather not no um <laughs> you know you know, grew up in the valley. W w did did music? Was in bands. Um, oh, the, oh. Let's see. Um, took some, you know, music in college. Quit college. Um, got a job as George in Beatlemania when it debuted here in L.A. At, you know, w whenever that was, way back when. Um, got out of Beatlemania. Started having bands around L.A. Decided that I wasn't 
I'm going to be a star, went to music school for a solid year, learned how to be an orchestrator, you know, sort of learned how to learn how to write, you know, for whoever, whatever, like be, be sort of professional. Um, got, but then got disillusioned with trying to be um, a legit musician and started making albums again, got a record deal, you know, just through the produced records, wrote songs, um and then lots of stuff happened lots of stuff didn't happen met paul started playing in the wild honey shows um somehow we got along real good and paul started using me as the music director so back up for a moment for um, us if you would rob and 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 describe the wild honey shows because those are a staple here in los angeles so paul started this i don't know what 25 30 years ago started having uh shows in a in a in his house he started the first one in his house it was a i think it was a a tribute to brian wilson music and had local musicians that he was networked with at the time and uh you know it was like kind of a cool underground pop scene that he was you know plugged into um and then he'd had i think he had another one that was a kinks it was a bed helm thing and then he rented out the Morgan Wixon Theater one year to do a, a, a second Brian Wilson tribute. And that kind of caught fire. Brian Wilson came, uh, a bunch wow. of cool people came and it was, it was and and I and that was the first one I played at. Um and and then we kind of he kind of did a few more of those type of shows and then once once he had Jacob, he kind of went underground for a while. Uh and then I don't know how old Jacob was when you decided to start doing shows again, Nine. but he was like re- he, Jacob was nine, and, and yeah. Paul started doing shows with renewed vigor and purpose, um, bigger shows, um, and and I started kind of applying myself more to making them sort of more presentable, more professional. We had more of a, a core band instead of just a bunch of people coming on and going off. Um, so it's a foundation. Is it is it a nonprofit, or do you raise money or yes. give money to various yeah. organizations? Yes. Talk about that because we want to solicit some donations sure. here because apparently this was a very expensive endeavor, yes. um, paying 52 musicians or whatever it was. So talk about where folks may learn more about Wild Honey and maybe make a donation to what you're doing. Sure. They can, uh, well, one, they can just go to the uh, PayPal is the best way. Wild Honey Foundation at Yahoo.com. That's the best donation way. Mm-hmm. Um We've been doing we give we've been giving money to the Autism Healthcare Collaborative, which um, is an organization that helped Jacob in uh, throughout the last ten years. Um, but it, initially, we our neurologist said, "Well, you should do this thing with internet conference with other uh, doc specialists from all f- forms of uh, autism care," and so we. But we needed three thousand dollars to do that in 2013, and so I said, "Well, let's start doing the shows again." And that's what—that's why we started doing the shows again. And um, so we we did Beatles shows, which are very easy easy to make money at. Um, so uh, because everybody everybody and also easy for the musicians because they already know the songs. So. Um, Anyway, we did a Beatles song. We we show um, Sergeant Pepper and Rubber Soul. We made enough money for Jacob's treatment and three other kids, and so it just got bigger from there. And we kept giving money to the same organization until now. And now I am the last two Wild Honey shows. Uh, we did a Big Star show in November of 2022, and then a Nugget show in 2023. And both of the proceedings from that. Of going into the symphony via the Autism Healthcare Collaborative. So good, and you're going to be at the Alex Theater with this symphony, the 71 yes. minute piece of music, yes. uh, on September 30th. And I exactly. suppose they can go to the Alex box office. That's a great theater, incidentally. I've worked in there. It's 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 got lots of great history. They used to sort of uh, do premieres of films in there back in the mm-hmm. 30s and 40s. It's it's a great theater. But but they really would like to have, as I read about your mission here, they would really like to. Have have a nice full audience for this thing to uh, honor Jacob and all the work they're doing, right? So they can get the tickets at the Alex box office, or would you have them? Have them go yeah, alextheater.org. Okay. Cool. And Rob, tell us a little more about your writing process with with Jacob. Are you 
are you face to face or are you just submitting little pieces based on his descriptions or you know and and can you do you know him well enough to know uh, whether or not what what you are suggesting is 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 clicking with him yeah well it, it, in the beginning it was a lot of face to face um just to find out how we were going to work it was a complete mystery at the beginning um uh i showed up with a keyboard and with loaded up with sounds and i just didn't know what to expect but uh after talking a bunch and he's wonderful to talk to you know he's um he's so um present and lucid and his answers are just right on target so whatever i want i just had to have the audacity to ask whatever you know needed to be asked and and uh we built up sort of this bond this trust um and i and in the beginning so i would ask him kind of minutia like okay so you if you say the word cacophony what are we really talking about and i'd play him some examples and he was very sure like oh, number three you know oh number th th things like that um how how edgy do we want to be uh, kind of questions like do we want to be we want to be how proud pleasing versus how challenging <laughs> i remember those were those were issues that were important to sort of iron out with him um but then um and then i would bring him pieces and initially i remember i brought because i it took me a while to get started because i don't normally write for orchestra it was it was um so i brought him some stuff just going here's just an idea of some sounds some little and and some some ideas and and he and he listened and he goes where's my symphony <laughs> and it was like, oh. basically saying like no this isn't it um so yeah so i you know but he ended up we ended up kind of like getting on a level where he was we were he was agreeing with what i was doing he was understanding it i was understanding what he was saying um and and it got to the point where i mean a lot of it was i had to generate stuff i felt like i was out in the woods you know but then at a certain point he was like this is exactly what i'm hearing and i started feeling a little bit like i was the music was kind of coming through me like i was sort of feeling his feelings as i was writing mm. so there's definitely sort of a happening and by the by the second half it was just kind of you know really kicking so you so started like, like locking in and channeling what he what he you know like this human energy that you were just locking into and, and channeling that's yeah i was gonna say and when he would sign off on something you had created would you then put it into charts and that's what you had to give other musicians right yes yeah, so so the, i was all i was writing it all on a, on a computer in into pro tools um so the pro tools you know i have all the sounds and it, it sounds pretty damn close to an orchestra um but then i gave it to a an orchestrator to put it onto actual a score and uh, that that can put it out okay so let's let's play a little something mason When the strings come in, okay, we'll play. We can play a little bit more uh, a little later. That's uh, that's extraordinary. And it, I'm wondering, Paul, what you notice in terms of his demeanor. <clears throat> Not you know after he started being able to express himself verbally, but also after he started working with Rob and was able to express himself um, artistically. Did you notice any any kind of like um, any weight lifting off of him and oh, a, li a light in his eyes? Yeah. Well, you know he he loves Rob. Yeah. And and he's well it's fine we found out the whole history because i've been taking him to wild honey rehearsals where rob has been leading the the band for you know 10 years now and uh it's probably the only times i can remember where he could be still for that many hours in in not go to the bathroom not do all his stuff 
and just sit there and soak it all in. And so he goes back with that. And then once he started typing, he was able to tell everybody about that and, and, you know, show his excitement for stuff. And, um, you know, it's, and also his self-injury, which was a big problem for many years where he, he, he would hurt himself very badly for uh, many years. And, um, that's pretty much gone. And it's, it's, it's so much better now, especially now he can type and tell us, you know, my stomach hurts or whatever the issue is um, that's making him upset. And that's a lot from the typing. And then the music just gives him so much joy because he can, I think he feels a lot of satisfaction in that people can now know who he is. How empowering. You, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. I mean, it gives him a yeah. place on the planet where people, yes. uh, autistic kids, anybody with any challenge like that often feels apart and separate from. That's oh, yes. just wonderful. Well, he's, he's doing, uh, some people have been sending him questions for interviews and uh, he, he's, he's in really enjoying that. Um, wow. Writing his, writing out his answers. Uh, we have a woman from NPR coming at the end of the week and and she sent him 15 questions. And so she's going to she's going to play the answers, you know, on his iPad. We can hear the voice on the iPad says the answer. So wow. she's going to put those on the on the on the on the thing. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a two different two two different kids now that he's doing the, the the symphony. And plus, he can tell us what he's doing. Like like I said, Jacob, when you go play your bongos, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm working on my new opera. You know. <laughs> now he's writing an opera. Yeah. I mean, this seems like, uh, has word about this uh, accomplishment spread to others in the autistic community where, I mean, this seems so teachable and aspirational for it, kids. It and is. I, I, and I think, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of very successful um, people in music and others that are autistic, but most of them are verbal in some ways or have a good enough motor planning that they can play instruments um so the so this is i think we're reaching a whole other class of of the spectrum or kids who are really disabled in terms of their physical ability to do anything and it's all mental awesome. yeah i'm hoping that we can use this as a calling card to have other people in the wild honey family we've got just a huge amount of talented people and um to pair up with other kids who obviously have the same stuff going on. I don't think Jacob's that unique. I just think he's abled by me and Rob and, 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 and he just needed that to, to get it out. And I think a lot of other kids are in the same, same situation. There's a film that I watched out of Iceland about 12 years ago. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It has two titles. I think it was called the sunshine boy and now it's called a mother's courage, but it's about mm -hmm. a child in Iceland and, that's the first time I saw a child's mind unlocked by a woman. They traveled to America, and she was able to get him to point to things and to compose his sentences. And his parents right. had no idea what was in there. And it was like traveling to another planet and yeah. learning that they have language and they have emotions and they have creativity and they have opinions. And this child also expressed an interest in in composing the music that was inside his his mind, I don't know if you saw mm -hmm. the film I'm talking yeah. about, but I, it no, had but me I, crying. I, I, I totally believe it, and I, you know, and I think the funny thing is, is Jacob's a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, his ability to do get to where he's gotten without any education, particularly about any of this stuff. I mean, like, no one really they didn't think he could read. But he taught himself at five, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, like I can show him like a, a sophisticated French film with sub subtitles from the 1930s. And he can understand every word that's spoken because he can read the subtitles and then he'll give you a little critique of, of it and a little synopsis. Wow. Wow. That is mind blowing. You know, uh, I have a, a little cousin who is autistic and she went to the Frostig Center in Pasadena for like 11 years. That was a that's a great school up there. Mm -hmm. And and uh, just from being in family gatherings, I've learned that over the last 10 or 15 years, the research about autism and the recognition of it at earlier ages and the science and the therapy behind it has really 
advanced over the last several years. And for reasons like you're talking about with Jacob, they're, they're being accepted into society and not as outcasts as much as they were. So they are making progress, aren't they? In yeah. Understanding- well, I think for me, for, for us as a family, we've, I think, made the discovery that it's more of a physical thing than a mental thing. I mean, I mean, autism is traditionally painted as a as a as a as a mental disability in some way in terms of they're quirky or they're different or and also you know as you go to the nonverbal end they just assume low IQ a lot of times um, but all that's false and and also the fact is Jacob's biggest problem isn't his brain it's his is his stomach. Mm-hmm. And there's there's people doing whole research things on the gut brain uh, mm-hmm. relationship and autism. So there's a, there's we, a correlation between uh, autism and kids with digestive problems. Exa- correct? Yeah, in terms of the the bacteria uh, <sighs> situation in the gut. Okay. And that there's a whole guy at ASU in, in Arizona who's done large studies about tr- transplanting the bacteria. Uh, uh, in, in autistic kids and giving them a fecal transplant and the improvements are huge. Wow. Um, and that's that's a very real uh, study. And so we found that if we if Jacob's gut is is in order as best we can do it at this point, he's so happy and so calm and he's a whole different human being. And and, and he tells us that all the time. Calm has returned. You know, he'll oh, type something like that. Wow. <laughs> and so, and, and you know, and if he's, and you know, if his gut is, is in order, his body is in order and he can do so many more things and he's so much happier and it's it's a whole thing. Wow. So. Rob, let me ask you a question. So did, did Jacob envision the instruments that these passages were played on and say, here's where I see violins being as as uh, Paul said, angry, and this is where the French horns come in. Or, I mean, was, was he that specific in the way he created this in his heart and soul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each each section, he would he would pretty much spec out what the main instruments were. And um, I remember wow. what, what kind of fascinated me early on was the combinations of instruments were, were things I'd never, like there was one, I think it was like harp and bongos. Whoa. And I, <laughs> wow. I, I'm in. Wow. Harp and bongos, you got <laughs> Let's me. Let's go. Or like chimes and bongos. And then uh, the, uh, the other, there was in the first movement, there's a part where the violins are tr- try, are sleep. They represent sleep. And then the uh, trump, to the trumpets, the brass represent uh, his stomach, I think, discomfort. And they have yeah. a war. That's interesting. There's like a back and forth. Yeah. They have a war. Eventually, sleep wins. Um, and these, this is just a wonderful way to create music. So um, he's expressing uh, it, his own journey through this piece. Yeah. Oh, a little, a little side note. Uh, his main instrument around the house is his congas and bongos, and uh, and he has the chimes, and uh, he, that's where we know he's making music when he runs in his room and starts playing all, all those things. And the harp thing, funny enough, comes from. He had a music therapist who's a very talented harp player, and she used to bring the harp to, to the house mm-hmm. um, and play for him uh, when he was about, I don't know, seven, eight, six. And so the, all those things he consumed, you know, the harp from the from the therapist and, uh, you know, all these things. He And then he incorporated it all into his story. So when you talk about, what's the term you use, not motor control, but something along those lines? Tell me the term Mo- again. Motor planning. Motor yeah. planning. What you mean by that is even just getting thoughts out of his mouth and it, yes. and uh, fingers, hands on a keyboard. Sure. So how how is he able to play the drums? And is is there something that can be improved upon regarding motor motor planning? Well, it, I find... Well, he does. He does do all those things, but he he doesn't do them the way he thinks of them. Mm. Uh, you know, he he can go do things at the piano, but it's not what he's thinking. Mm-hmm. So to transfer what's in his brain to what's in his hands is pretty impossible for him at this point. But but it, it, tasks he can conquer tasks though if you do hand over hand 
with him repetitively for every single day. So, like, for instance, I got him to go in the car, open the car door, put the seatbelt on, close the car door, and do the vice versa to get out. Um, and that took me like four to six months of hand over hand re- repetition. Wow. So when but he's, when but they, he's got it, he's got now it. He does it all the time. So when you have that term motor planning, to me, the connotation is that it's not just that he can't physically do it, the, the disconnect right. between his mind. It's that right. he, his mind doesn't conceive of what movements and how to apply them. Yeah. He, he has to be, you know, it has to be ingrained in, in him. Mm-hmm. And then he can get it and he'll do it and then he'll have have that um but it's a struggle that there i know there are lots of different offshoots of uh, of the autism spectrum but just in, in a couple of sentences what is autism <laughs> well it's 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 something different for every every it's a spectrum as everybody says i mean it, it can go anywhere from you know just quirky behavior with you know full language and um all the way to where jacob is and beyond where they're completely locked in their in their in their brains um and i i think the the motor planning can vary you know it gets worse the they say the stomach gets worse the more severe the they are so Wow. So I, I want to get people to come to see you at the Alex on September 30th. Is this the largest group that uh, Jacob has ever seen his music performed in front of? Oh, yeah. That's it's the cool. only group. <laughs> so am I right? You have 54 musicians or 52 musicians? I believe 54. And and, and this was very costly or is very costly. There's it's like stu- 100,000. Uh, he's using students. Oh, good. But, but it's still yeah. $100,000 to put this production on correct so on. We, we would love people to be inspired by your amazing story and if they can't attend the alex theater which is a cool place to go if you're in southern california and it's an iconic place you should go but if not we'd love to urge them to make a donation uh to the wild honey foundation because wow it's just it gave me goosebumps reading your story and and and, and, and i'll tell you what else i was stricken by it was your patience and your um I, I think the universe puts the correct people together, and th- th- it's divine intervention that you ended up being Jacob's father because you have so much patience and uh, and you've worked so hard, and um, it's it's really to be mentioned and applauded. Well, you know, it's funny. You, you get in uh, for me at least. I get in a task, and that's that's the end of it. I just have to see it through to whatever whatever that takes me. And in this particular journey, it's, it's, you know, it's a a lifelong situation. Um, But Jacob is so entertaining and so uh, interesting and you never know what he's going to say. And so that makes it, you know, gives us a joy that, you know, that can't be put any price on. It's, he's just a, a one of a kind human being. That's for sure. Tell us how you stretched and expanded as a musician, Rob, through working with with Jacob. (laughs) I definitely wrote stuff I never would have written otherwise. So, you know, um, even, I mean, I I know a certain amount of music theory. I kind of peter out like like jazz, you know. Um, (laughs) Me too. And I'm writing stuff like What? Me too. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you know, like once it's like beyond like sharp nine, eleven, you know, um, it's like it turns into math for me, and I'm you no, know. <laughs> but but I was writing stuff that I can't tell you what the chords are. I was just like on the computer moving notes around, and it sounds it sounds way more sophisticated than anything I've ever done. Um, also, the other thing is, you know. I can sit around and write music all day long, but what what I don't have the gift of is what what's driving it. What's the story? You know, the great great songwriters are storytellers. Mm -hmm. Jacob has a story and and the story is so moving and the subject is so moving that um, that was the gift, you know, for me. Um, Where are the students from that you're going to have in this piece? USC. 
Oh, Thornton, wow. Thornton School of oh, Music. Oh, my gosh, that's wonderful. They're all very gifted down there. They wouldn't be there. <laughs> so ha- tell us how you, uh, how you how you're collaborating with them and the conductor that you found, and you know, and that because once you know you've got this child with this enormous creative mind, and that and what he sees is huge, and now it, it's on you to like execute. So how did you how did you go about that? Well, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, um, <laughs> but we knew that you know, in terms of classical staging, I mean, and what it took and we figured it out. And, uh, I, I met this, well, I, this, this man, uh, Tim page, who was a, uh, a USC music professor at one point, And he still has a lot of connections there. And, uh, we connected through to him because we have mutual pop music friends. And so we connected with Tim who's retired, but still very active in, uh, classical music field. In fact, he won a Pulitzer for a piece on Glenn Gould at some point in his career. Um, So anyway, he connected us with Daniel Newman Lessler, the conductor, who was a former student of his. And and then a few months later, he connected us with the actual school of music and Sharon Lowry, and she liked the project, and so she signed off on it, and now we've been able to, you know... uh, get a get a a, a wrangler <laughs> to get all 54 people together and um one thing led to another and then here we are yeah not that this is important because the victory is already yours you 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 gave jacob this wonderful victory in his life and gave him a sense of self and contributing something to the planet but is there a next step could you see anybody in the autism arena or in a special needs arena maybe commissioning a piece from jacob to, for their particular needs or is there something he could do beyond what he's done here um i i hope i hope that one unforgettable sunrise gets played by other orchestras mm-hmm. um i think i think it's a great piece and i think other other people should play it um and yeah, you know, we're open to anything and uh, um and we've actually had some interest in um uh, Jacob's story as, as a movie. Wow. Yeah. So there there is some uh, some interest in that. Mm-hmm. It really is a, a really an inspirational story. It it's it's quite extraordinary and just God bless you all for your efforts and uh you know, there's just so much. There's so much hope and and joy, and, and that you're unlocking. And you know, it's an honor to have you on our show. So, uh, we'll go. What are where are the best places for people to find you online and to learn more about Wild Honey your organization? Uh, J- uh, yeah, the, yeah, our so. Facebook group is is the best. Uh, it's it, Wild Honey Foundation and at Facebook. You, you, I have several pages, and I'm there all the time. So. People can contact me directly that way. And tell us, just give us a little snapshot of other shows you put on and, and what else is coming, you know, just in the pop arena and the rock pop folk arena. Sure. Well, we just did the uh, a, co- a collaboration with Lenny Kay, who's uh, Patti Smith's guitar player, um, who also curated this uh, n- famous Nuggets compilation of garage bands, psychedelic bands from the 60s. And uh, we did a show, the Nuggets show in May at the Alex um we had all kinds of people like peter buck of rem we had Susanna hoffs um a lot of a lot of different people and also a lot of the original guys from the 60s actually performed at the show as well um so that was our last show in may and uh we did a love and spoonful show in 2020 that reunited the surviving members of the spoonful including john sebastian for the first time in decades we and had him on was, this podcast. He's a hoot. <laughs> yeah, John was great. Speaks he, his mind. Well, I told him, I said, I said, I'll fly you out here if you just do this one song. <laughs> and, and I said, I'll, it'll be first class, no problem. And then he said, I can do more than that. And uh, I said, yeah, I know. And then, so he, he ended up doing, sitting in like 30 songs out of 40. Oh, oh wow. Nice. What a and treat. singing a bunch and collaborating with rob in the uh you know on the musical direction of the evening and he was great and, and he'd show up an hour early to tune his auto harps oh yeah oh, i forgot that's his right auto yeah. Harps. Awesome. oh yeah it t- it cost us like four thousand dollars to get all his stuff out 
Oh my god! Wow. But that was okay. It was all like it was. Uh, we sold out the show because he was there, so it didn't matter. Do you have so. your future uh, gigs listed anywhere where folks may find out what you've got coming up uh, next? Yeah, they can see them at the at the at the at, at the uh, Facebook page uh, oh, okay. and group. Yeah. Um, we don't have anything big show scheduled right now, but I do shows in my backyard. I have a full stage with the full professional PA and we have room for about 110 people. And uh, we've been doing shows in my backyard since 2013 as well. And weren't you putting a studio together? I do. I have one uh, downstairs here. Cool. Right cool, now. cool. And yeah. uh, uh, the COVID kind of got in the way with actually doing a lot of things in there. I've done like just live streams from there, mm -hmm. three or four. Mm -hmm. But actually having an audience and stuff in the studio, not yet. Not yet, but it's coming. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're going to have all these links in our show notes for everybody um, to thank you to uh, click on and donate and buy tickets and everything And people good. can contact me directly at wildhoneyfoundation at yahoo.com. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Wild Honey. Say that again. It's wildhoneyfoundation at yahoo.com. All right, here come your closing credits. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, or we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. And if you enjoy the show, please give us a nice rating and a review in Apple Podcasts, and uh, we might read it on the show like we did earlier today. You can sign up for our spicy newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. And we want to thank our guests, Paul Rock and Rob Laufer. Our team includes producer Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, Lori DeWall, Garrett Arch, Nick Broussard, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palenker here with Fritz Coleman. Be well and wise, and we will see you along the media path. Hey, Craig, it's Adam Schiff. I just want to wish you a very happy birthday. I know I'm not as cool as Lorna Luft. I'm not related to Judy Garland, but, uh, but in any event, I hope you will accept these birthday wishes. Uh, so enjoying hanging out with your sister. She is awesome. But then, you know, it's in the genes, wouldn't you say? Uh, happy birthday. Wish you all the best. Happy birthday. I love you, Craig. Happy birthday.